Hi, welcome to another presentation by Grow a Strong Family. I am your host and hostess or whatever. My name is Mara Briere, and I am the founder and president of Grow a Strong Family. Given to you through the generous donations of our many participants and, and through the Shana 15 grant. This presentation is Loss and Forgiveness, and it's produced by Grow a Strong Family. In Grow a Strong Family is an organization that supports families uprooted by mental illness. In this webinar, we are going to be talking about loss, forgiveness, and different strategies that we can use to get We say loss. What do you mean by loss? Why would somebody have a loss when a family member or a loved one is diagnosed with a mental illness or other chronic disease? And it's because we are left to cope with learning how to live with a person who is physically present, they're here in our lives, but psychologically and emotionally different. Illness changes people. Illness changes the roles and the rules and the expectations that we have in our relationships. In essence, chronic illness and mental illness is a chronic illness similar to diabetes, heart disease, substance use disorder, um, FIV, uh, HIV, um, cancer. Those are all chronic illnesses uh, other neurological illnesses and, and interconnective tissue diseases, they require changes in our relationships. And that means we have to renegotiate our contracts because we can't always have, they can't always live up to the roles and expectations that we have come to expect between ourselves and our loved ones who are diagnosed with a chronic disorder and, and mental illness. So the kind of loss that we experience is called ambiguous loss or ambiguous grief or disenfranchised grief. And what disenfranchised grief is a loss that is not publicly acknowledged and sanctioned. In other words, we end up getting the diagnosis and as families, as loved ones, we are grappling with the monumental task of adjusting to life with our loved ones in a whole different way than we had anticipated. And we tend to isolate and we tend to not mention it to other people because it is not socially sanctioned. Well, they're still there. Um, they, they're living with you or whatever. Uh, uh, you know, many parents go through this when their adult children are diagnosed with a mental illness and their adult children do not follow the more standard developmental course of their peers. And depending on how serious the mental illness is, it could be a lifelong process of negotiating and renegotiating and renegotiating. So it could be a lifelong process of managing the loss. And there are waves that come to family members as our loved ones are not able to perform or function in the same way that they had prior to developing their illness. And by the way, this is true of any long-term serious chronic illness, of which one is mental illness, another is substance use disorder, criminal behavior, and the caveat here is that unfortunately, when the psychiatric institutions were closed, the prisons became the new psychiatric institutions, and the numbers tell us this, that there is a direct inverse proportion. The fewer hospitals that exist to support those individuals diagnosed with mental illnesses, the greater the, the prison population has become with those individuals diagnosed with mental illnesses. The other area where individuals find families find themselves experiencing disenfranchised grief is when they are functioning with dementia and other neurological disorders that rob our loved ones of the very essence sometimes of who they are and were. Ambiguous loss is a significant loss that is lacking in clarity finality and has no sense of closure. One of the ways that we see this is when we have a loved one who was psychologically present but physically absent. 
um, individuals who may be confined to a wheelchair and um, maybe they've had a stroke. And so they're clear as a bell psychologically, but their bodies don't perform for them in the way that they want them to. A classic example of this would probably be ALS, because individuals who suffer from ALS have bodies that basically have failed them, let them down, um, prevent them from performing any of the tasks that a healthy body does, including things like making dinner, um, taking a shower, uh, taking care of children, driving, but they're psychologically present. We can have conversations with them. They can learn. They can adapt psychologically to their circumstances. They could take advantage of the various prosthetic devices that are available for their use. So they're in a way, they're here, but they're not here. And we have some mourning as the more able partner both physically and psychologically, perhaps, to manage the situation at the same time that we're losing some of what we have come to expect and rely on in our significant relationships. The other way that we might experience ambiguous grief is by saying goodbye when the, without leaving or when, when our loved ones are physically present but psychologically absent. And this is what we typically see when there's a dementia because the individual is physically here, um, but they're psychologically unavailable. And when our loved ones are symptomatic with their mental illnesses, then we will notice that they're, again, physically present, but psychologically absent. Because when someone has a mental illness, their brains aren't working properly. The connections, the neurotransmitters aren't firing off. It is a brain disorder. And there are periods when individuals with brain disorders can be stable, clear, even in remission. There are great periods when they cannot be and their thinking is distorted, they misinterpret things, their narrative, if you will, is unavailable to them in the way that they will rewrite their experiences to support whatever it is that their particular illness is informing them. Uh, their ability to think critically tends to be diminished. Their ability to assess and perceive in the same way that they might have before has also shifted and changed. So we would experience an ambiguous grief or loss because we they look the same to us, but they're, the things that they say, the way that they behave, their capacity for interaction with us has changed. When loved ones have mental illnesses, there are times when they cannot fulfill their roles in our relationships with them, and we miss them. I most often hear this from when we have partners who have mental illnesses, when they are triggered and they are symptomatic, that for a period of time we feel as though they are unavailable to us. And that is when we mourn the loss of our partner, we go through this when we have our parents who may be having a, a mental illness. And very often, elderly individuals experience pretty deep depressions. And that's when they can become unavailable to us. But it's not a dementia. And it's not something that makes them incapable. But it makes things different. And when our children cannot cannot continue with their developmental milestones as they enter their 20s, 30s, and 40s, that's also times when their roles in their relationships with us have shifted. And we are in uncharted territory in ways that we had not anticipated and from which there are very few roadmaps. Some things in life cannot be fixed. They can only be carried. And when we love anybody who has a chronic illness of any kind, this is what it is. They have to carry their part and we have to carry our part. And our part involves a loving them regardless of the presentation. And tapping into that can sometimes be very difficult because of the loss that we experience. Acceptance comes from forgiveness. And what do we mean by this? When there 
whenever we have this sense of loss, we can become very angry at the demands that are made or the perceived demands. The um, I, I had a, a friend whose partner was diagnosed with MS and progressed very quickly. And she was very angry that he was as ill as he was because she said, I didn't sign up for this. I never signed up to have to change my housing because... He can't go up to a second floor unless we get an elevator and we can't afford it. And they had just bought a Victorian house to renovate. She was feeling let down because she had to prepare all the meals. And that was something they had done together. And it was a big piece of their partnership. When we have ambiguous losses, when we have loved ones who are diagnosed with chronic illnesses, it, it is oftentimes a safety issue that we cannot have them participating in some of the activities that they may have participated in with us before their diagnosis and certainly before they become stabilized. So we need to forgive them for having a chronic illness and for the many, many, many changes and shifts that we may have to go through in order to accommodate and adapt. We are, we're prepared to go through life and make changes, but sometimes when we're kind of hit broadside, we're not quite sure what to do. And because of the, the lack of social sanctioning of the kind of loss that we experience, that families experience when loved ones are diagnosed with mental illnesses, we don't have a blueprint. And we don't have a way to move forward. So some of what we feel is angry, and we need to forgive ourselves for that. Sometimes we feel disappointed and discouraged. Sometimes we have horrible thoughts, <laughs> but they're just thoughts. And as long as we keep them between our ears or with very trusted friends and don't act out on our loved ones, we're okay. We also need to come up with a way to forgive those who don't understand. People don't know what they don't know. We don't know what we don't know. So it's often very helpful for us to be able to come up with a plan or a way to, to be able to explain to other people like you may not know or you may not be aware or this is what our current experience is or if you don't want to go there, everything's just fine and move on. You determine. One of the things about being in a place of forgiveness is that it gives us the present. The present is a gift we give ourselves. We can't rewrite the past. We can't fix it. We can't make it better. The past is the past. For that, for that we have to keep an open mind. We have to be true to our experiences, and we cannot allow ourselves to sink into negativity. We don't know what each day will bring. There are breakthroughs all the time. And even, you know, there's an expression in substance use programs, 12-step programs, where they say 12 years into the woods generally means 12 years out of the woods. There are very few shortcuts. But one of the shortcuts that we do have is the shortcut of gaining more education, acquiring more skills, giving ourselves permission to understand that we are going through waves of grief and to allow ourselves the time and the space. When do we go through these waves? Certainly in the beginning when the diagnosis is first brought forward. And each time the diagnosis is, is tweaked, or reassessed, or clearly not a medical issue. I always say to people, uh, you know, rule out the rule out the medical before you go to the psychiatric. Um, tweak medications on an as-needed basis because there is no cure, so there is no perfect solution. And we have to develop a new relationship or a different relationship with our loved ones. But if we remember that this is true in every relationship over time we might be able to manage it more gracefully that this is the task that we're, at, we're offered at this point in time with this loved one around these issues. And if we consider it an opportunity rather than something foisted upon us and, and approach it kicking and screaming, we give us ourselves permission to relax into it, to lean into it. 
we we loved this person enough to to participate in relationship with them in as much of the process as they will allow us to. And this is true in every relationship over time anyway. And if we remember that, then think of the gift you're being given that you can at least recognize what you're being offered at this time with your eyes wide open. And that's what we need to learn about for means to cease to feel resentment. It's not their fault any more than it's our fault. People get sick. I once had a PCP, a primary care doctor, tell me, you know, Mara, it's just, a, you know, the draw. It's the way that the rocks are tumbled or the dice is tumbled. It's a roll of the dice. It could happen to anybody. If you have a genetic predisposition and considering that one in five people will go through at some point in their life, an episode of mental illness or mental unwellness, then it makes sense that it's a combination of genetic predisposition and circumstances that can catalyze or trigger an event. Um, for example, one of the things that we have found is that there seems to be a link between Lyme disease, strep, and triggering mental illness, especially in adults which I thought was very interesting because it starts off with something medical, but that it has a, um, a cognitive or a neurological impact on how somebody can process and manage that. And so it's a combination of factors that lead to a diagnosis of a mental illness. And so we have to learn it's not their fault and it's not our fault. It just is what is. So we need to give up resentment of they have to get back to me. They have to make it right. They have to. They don't. Nobody has to do anything. When we've been harmed, when other people make transgressions against us, it's up to us to decide how we want to respond. If we continue to give them our power, that means that we have expectations of their behavior, which, by the way, is something we have no control over. All we might have control over is how we respond. If we have expectations of other people's behavior, then we are in a state of reaction. We react to them instead of responding to them on our own behalf and hopefully in a win-win way. So how do we forgive our loved ones for their mental illnesses? First of all, we need to accept that their mental illness exists and it's beyond our control. Um, I like to use the three C's because they help me remember that we didn't cause it, we can't cure it, and we cannot control it. Those are the three C's. Remember that when you are looking at your loved one and, and they're in the middle of an episode and their disease is rampant and we need to decide what are we going to do for ourselves and for them for safety, for well-being, for a healthy response. We have to learn to forgive them for how they might behave and what that behavior looks like and how it might affect us. We need to get wise about having a, a safety plan, having some one-liners to help us diffuse arguments, to learn how to communicate more effectively, to learn how to take care of ourselves and to provide a safe environment for everybody, to learn how to say things like, I love you too much to argue about this, or, you know, you, your voice is really loud and I'm getting scared, so I'm going to take a step back and when your tone is calmer, I'll be happy to listen to you. Those are some of the language things that we can learn and practice and use to help us in situations because typically what gets us so angry when our loved ones are out of control is that we cannot control them and we're scared, sometimes we're hurt. If we can recognize that, we can put plans in place for us to experiment with so that we can develop a safer more healthy way of responding without reacting. And then we don't even have to forgive them for how their behavior is affecting us because we've already taken care of it on our own behalf. 
Forgiveness can be an action verb in terms of pardoning. And pardoning means that I know you are unwell and this is what your illness looks like. And this is what I need to do when the illness shows up in this way. You may share it with your loved ones when they're in a stable place and a good place and you can work together collaboratively, but you may not be able to do that, especially in the beginning. It doesn't mean you don't do it. You still create a safety plan for yourself and a procedure and a process on how to create some sense of this is what the illness looks like and this is, this is not about me. And, and get to that loving place of compassion and sadness. What are some of the triggers or the red flags for you? Your body is tense. Your breathing is shallow. You might start pacing. You might start feeling anxious. You might start repeating some of the words, the way their faces might look. You don't have to. You can do that. that was, that's giving you very good information because what that is alerting to you is that you're reacting, and that reaction is giving you information so that you can take control for yourself, so that you can come up with a response that keeps you calm and relaxed, and you're breathing even, and that your thinking moves forward, not keeping in a repetitive cycle. Forgiveness does not mean forgetting, especially when it comes to dealing with our loved ones who have mental illnesses because we have to learn what their red flags are and what their symptoms look like. So forgetting is not an option. Oh yeah, when she gets very symptomatic, her tone gets very snippy, she enunciates at the end of her words very, very carefully, she's very pressured in her speech, she gets this look on her face of a flat affect. Her eyes won't look at me. Those are all scary unless I start identifying them and saying, oh yeah, so this means that the medication needs to be tweaked. And I can say to her, your medication needs to be tweaked. And if she won't, you know, blow my head off. And there are times when she says, well, I don't see what you're seeing. This isn't one of my loved ones. And I say, that's okay. And I will call her prescriber and let her prescriber know this is what I am observing. And in our case, her prescriber has, um, has the HIPAA so that he can talk with me freely. But even if he didn't, he would still have the ability to access and hear what I have to say. And this is true with any prescriber or medical professional or even mental health professional. Even if our loved ones have not signed a release to talk back with us, we still can give them the information. And I always urge family members to do that. Acceptance does not mean condoning. So don't make excuses for our loved ones not being well. It doesn't mean that their behavior is okay. If you don't let anybody yell at you, it doesn't matter if they're well or not well, right? You don't let anybody yell at you. So that's what we say. I don't let anybody yell at me. When you're ready, when your voice can be as calm as mine, I'll be happy to talk to you. And that kind of leads you to walking away. So just using that kind of language, which is very appropriate boundary setting, you are already establishing a system which enables you to take care of yourself and your loved one because you're not going to allow them to continue to mistreat you. So we have to learn how to set healthy boundaries, how to create healthy responses, communicating in healthy ways. And these are some of the examples. Forgiveness sometimes means giving up all hope of a better past. You know what? In every family, stuff happens. Most families figure out a way to deal with it. Some families do the best they can. Some families may not have breathing room to be able to deal with it. But it's still the past. Move on. Even forget, how does no sound to you? When we forgive and forget, we're acting in a very naive way, in which case we're usually surprised when the same behavior hits us. If we forget, but if we forgive, but we do not forget, we acquire wisdom. When we don't forgive, but we forget, then you're like that guy in Memento and he, every time he had to go back to the past and relive whatever the experiences were, he kept writing on his arm some new information so that he could try to remember. 
and he kept going back. It's kind of like a hamster on a wheel, and you keep going round and round and round, getting nowhere fast. If you don't forgive and you don't forget, that's just stupid because you stay stuck. They may never be stuck, but you stay stuck. Not really very helpful. The best strategies that we can use, one of them is meditation, especially if you're anxious. Meditation is very useful. If you find yourself getting into a space of depression, move, do some exercise. Yoga is very good because it kind of gets you to do both. It's meditation and movement. Adult coloring has been proven through research to have the same effect as meditation does. So it's a nice way to kind of guide you to be doing something and creating at the same time. And I love affirminators because affirminators are affirmations with a sense of humor. Eric Arroz wrote this blog piece called The Agony of Forgiveness, Making Amends After Mental Illness. And what I really liked about what he had to say was that even though he had done things that were very destructive to his family, while biochemically removed from reality, he still had done them. He says, if someone burns your house down by mistake, it is an accident, but that accident can destroy your entire life. He's not saying forgive and forget. What he's saying is, even though I have an illness, even though I can behave in very destructive ways, those behaviors have an impact on the people I love. And when he was well enough, he did go ahead and make amends. And his loved ones were only too willing to say, oh, yes, we forgive. And part of making amends is coming up with a plan. And sometimes our loved ones can't come up with a plan. So part of the forgiveness process is coming up with a plan, helping them come up with, would you be willing to listen to to me when I say I'm seeing these red flags? What do you think we can do? You can start developing a safety plan. You can start even looking at a RAP. RAP is Wellness Recovery Activity Plan, something you can do. With this is a fabulous resource, Hidden Times, Hidden Healers, because we they talk about the author, Julie Taylor Johnson, talks about an eight-stage healing is forgiveness. And this is a lovely affirmation. I forgive myself for any mistakes I have made. I forgive and release those who have harmed me. In this, we are again reminded to release the emotional pain. Acknowledge the behavior, how you've been disappointed, lied to, frightened, harmed. Feel your feelings. They're just feelings. If you feel them and don't judge them, they will come and they will go. You can move through them and release them. Then you don't get stuck in ne negativity or resentment. And ultimately, forgiveness is the ultimate act of love, the ultimate act of acceptance. It allows movement and growth. It keeps you away from wishing that things could be different than they are. What is forgiveness the ultimate form of self-care. When we are willing to get to a place of forgiveness, our bodies relax, our breath becomes even, we become relaxed physically and mentally, our thoughts slow down, we're able to concentrate on the here and now, we are present for ourselves and for others. When we don't do forgiveness, we basically are saying it's okay for us to hurt ourselves. It's okay for us to increase our blood pressure, to have shallow breathing, to get ill. We don't need to do that. We can instead love ourselves enough to put ourselves in the place, to feel our feelings, not get stuck in them, let them go, and prepare for the next wave by taking good loving care of ourselves. In Forgiveness is also the willingness to drop the narrative on a particular injustice and so stop telling ourselves over and over and over and over again the story of what happened, what they did, how we were hurt, and all the rest of the upsetting things that we remind ourselves of in relation to this unforgivableness. When unforgivableness is related to illness, 
then we need to edit the story. And we need to remind ourselves that we didn't cause it, we can't control it, we can't cure it. They didn't cause it. They can't control it. They can't cure it. What they can do is communicate more effectively, as can we. And what they can do is do the best they can to be well, just like we need to do the best we can to be well. And very often, the process becomes more collaborative when we are in a place of acceptance, when we recognize the signs and symptoms and we are prepared to act in a way that is loving and safe and setting appropriate limits because limits take care of ourselves and take care of others. This is a decision to let the past be what it was, to leave it as it is, imperfect, and not what we wish it had been means that we stop the shoulda, coulda, woulda and relinquish the idea that we can create a better past or the present that we wanted or the future that we were looking forward to. We still don't know what the future is. And with medication and different opportunities, many of our loved ones will be able to rejoin mainstream society. And for those that may not be able to rejoin mainstream society, there is still quality life and quality relationship. There's still love. There are still many moments and opportunities to engage. It's just going to look different. That's all. Moving on doesn't mean you forget about things. It just means you have to accept what happened. And Plant has written seven rules of forgiveness. The first one is, as we've talked about quite a bit, forgiveness doesn't mean that you have to forget. Forgiveness doesn't mean you're minimizing your experience of being a victim. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you're a chump. It's not a sign of weakness, naivety, or... Forgiveness doesn't depend upon the other person apologizing and accepting your offer of forgiveness. You cannot expect people who wrong you to fully understand or appreciate what they did was wrong. They may never admit they did anything at all that was problematic. And that's okay, because we're not doing this, this action of forgiveness for their benefit. We're doing it for ours. We're doing it to take care of ourselves so that we don't need anything from us. Forgiveness is a process. It isn't an all or none, black or white, once and done kind of thing. It's a process because it is part of the grieving work that we do over and over and over again whenever we love anybody who has a chronic illness, especially a chronic mental illness. Forgiveness is for your health and well-being. Research shows that holding on to anger is toxic for your health because no one wants to be around someone who's chronically angry, bitter, and resentful and unforgiving. It's also something that robs you of your health and well-being. It is in your best interest to forgive others for their transgressions. It's not necessarily in their best interest. They still have to live their lives. They still have to look in the mirror at themselves. But this is about what's best for you. And the secret sauce in forgiveness is letting go of the anger. And there are times you need to be angry and you need to feel it because you know what? It's there. So feel it. Acknowledge it. If it's anger over and it, anger is something sometimes that's very healthy that motivates us to do something, then use it for that. And then it becomes an act of love and forgiveness. Because the energy that drove it is the energy of righting a wrong and something you can do. Sometimes the anger is the anger over your powerlessness or your hurt. If that's how you identify it, acknowledge that and work on that. You have the opportunity to create a different story of your life moving forward. New relationships with your loved ones. If you can describe in detail what this looks like for you, through art, through music, photography, dance, create a vision board, whatever form is meaningful for you, you are already well on the road to your own self-healing. There are no shortcuts. You cannot forgive someone until you have fully felt the pain that has been caused to you. And you can unhook yourself by unhooking them first. If we realize that forgiveness has to do with how we take better care of ourselves and how we can go through life in a more healthy way, 
then it's a win for everybody. It's a win for them, even if the focus isn't on them, it's on us. One of the things that I did with my anger was create Grow a Strong Family because what made me so angry was the isolation, was the lack of social sanction, was the, was the sense that people don't understand. And it was also the sense that families need each other in order to be able to create that blueprint to move forward one step at a time, one movement at a time, one episode at a time, so that we can be more efficient and effective and loving and compassionate, and we can also educate and advocate more effectively. That's what I did with my anger. In this webinar, we've discussed loss, forgiveness, and various strategies, including editing the narrative that we have about our loved ones, their illness, and our response. Laid plans fail. Stick to your normal as much as you can. Eat and drink in moderation. Build in nature time. Have backup plans and backup plans of your backup plans. Basically, take good There are many resources. I've included them on this webinar, but they're on the web page. And they're also at our resource page on growastrongfamily.org.